There you go, we are recording. Good afternoon, everyone. This is module eight, part three of our pharmaceutical and medical device manufacturing operator course. Um, and again, we have Ruth Super with us this afternoon. It's gonna give us some um, uh, information on aseptic gowning and behaviors. So with that, Ruth, it's up to you. All right, good afternoon. We are going to be moving to overview part three which deals with aseptic gowning and behaviors. However, before we start, I just kind of want to go over a discrepancy in the crossword puzzle. Can you still see that, Brianna, my screen? We got it. Yes, okay. ma'am, we can. Okay. And the crossword puzzle from um, overview part two. Um, question dealing, uh, questions three and four dealing with the classifications of filters. That information was removed from the slideshow. However, um, I inadvertently forgot to update this crossword. So for anybody that is having trouble completing it, um, a water loving filter, which is what we use to filter our liquids, is considered to be a hydrophilic filter, um, fill it, referring to love. Um, and then for our air filters, which are water hating, those are our hydrophobic filters um, with phobic refer referring to fear of. And also question number seven, the correct answer across is sterilization. However, this definition um, process by which a sterile product is packaged into a sterile container in a way that maintains sterility refers to aseptic processing. So that uh, definition will be uh, corrected to match sterilization. Um, so for anybody that's having trouble completing it, th these are your correct answers. And our apologies for that discrepancy. And then you also want to be sure that you log in this week, um, check any activities that you have um, that are coming due, as well as your due dates. And with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with today. All right, so today we're going to go over some core definitions, a few we covered last session and a few of which are new. Then we'll review personnel training and monitoring, move into discussing our aseptic gowning and behaviors, as well as discuss cleaning and disinfection activities in our aseptic processing area. And for a complete list of the objectives, um, you can locate them under the syllabus section within course content. So just a reminder um, from last week, for a area or item to be considered sterile, it's going to be free of microorganisms. And then aseptic, that's maintaining the state of control. And we reach the state of control by using, first of all, by having a aseptic work area and performing our activities in a manner that reduces, eliminates, and controls microbiological contamination of our sterile product. Um, we commonly use the acronym APA. That's our aseptic processing area. That's gonna be a dedicated area within the manufacturing facility where these aseptic uh, processes and activities are going on. It's gonna be designed in a manner, have filters, have air filters, um, humidity controls and monitors, pressure controls um, and uh, monitors such as that so that we know we're maintaining control. And then contamination, which is kind of new for today, is the introduction of any material that's either viable, which means it's a living organism or non-viable. These are gonna be our um, contaminants that are not living themselves, but they kind of provide a way for living organisms to move around. So that's going to be dust, um, things such as that. And these are not part of our validated product. So if we're making cough syrup and we're not supposed to have dust inside of it, then dust is a um, form of contamination. 
So the difference between non-viable and viable particles, the main difference is our viable particles contain one or more living organisms. And our non-viables, they do not contain living organisms themselves, but they are a mode of transportation for living microorganisms. Our viable particles, we are going to monitor those by using settle plates or air sampler, which I show um, a picture of on the next slide. And then our non-viable particles, we use a particle counter that actually takes a uh, sample of air and it counts the size and the number of uh, particles in that air sample. So here's a picture of our air sampler and we have a settle plate here. So this plate is looking for viable organisms. So air is going to come into the holes on the top of the air sampler. And as the air goes through the holes on the sampler, then it's going to enter onto the settle plate here. Any microorganisms that are on the settle plate, we, uh, we take them, we put them in an incubator, we make it nice and cozy for them to grow. And then in about a week or so, we'll be able to visualize any organisms that were living in that air. And then for our particles, it's a little bit different. We use our particle counter here. Air enters the counter through the funnel. And then on the screen, it's actually monitoring the size of the particles in microns. So 0.5, very, 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 very small. And then five are our bigger um, size particles. And then on the right-hand side, it actually keeps a tally of the total number of microns in that, in that sample. So for knowing that viable and non-viable is living and non-viable is not living, but is a mode of transportation, um, should we be concerned with monitoring particles that do not contain living organisms? I know I think it's just one of us today. So well, no, did, it, did somebody else join? I think, okay, we have Michelle. Okay. No, we have about Okay. Okay, we have some more. Okay, that's some good. Okay, I was thinking it was still just the one person. Okay. <laughs> All right, so anybody want to unmute and take a shot at this question or answer in the chat? Should we be concerned about particles that contain non-living organisms and why or why not? Michelle, you need to unmute. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I realized the last video I was on a lot, so I'm putting myself on no video. <laughs> 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 okay. So I was going to say, yes, you should be concerned because the non-viable are still a mode of transportation, correct? Or yes. No? Yep. That is absolutely perfect. Um, our non-viables can allow our viables to move from place to place and um, greatly increase cross-contamination. So we have to be concerned with both. So great answer, thank you. Anybody have any questions on anything we covered in that section? Okay. So aseptic processing, um, we touched on this last section. This is where we're taking our sterile product we package it in a sterile container and we maintain sterility. So our individual parts are sterilized and then we have to figure out how do we put it all together and not contaminate it. So an example um, for a, this, this would be more for your uh, liquid pharmaceutical companies where we have our caps, your bottles, your plugs, and your if we're making cough syrup, our formulated drug, that's going to be our cough syrup, that the liquid, and they're all sterilized <laughs> separately. 
Then our plastics are going to go through our irradiator. This was our uh, gamma form of sterilization last week that um, we're using the gamma rays. And then our liquid has to go through our sterile filtration that we discussed that's using the uh, hydrophobic or the hydrophilic. Um, in this case, we're doing liquid. So I want I want a filter that's going to allow water to go through. I want I want a filter that loves water. So I would do a hydrophilic um, filter here. And then now that we have these, we have our plastic sterilized and we have our cough liquid sterilized. Now we have to put the cough syrup into the bottles and put the cap or if it's a dropper the plug into the bottle and this is our aseptic filling operation this is where our apa is and then finally our product is released out to our patients in the market so ruth uh, yes ma'am we had a question on black in, um on blackboard about the difference between aseptic processing and sterilization and uh, as i'm looking at this um slide of yours and and Y'all remember, I am not a subject matter expert here, but I just wanted to kind of throw a guess out here. I think the actual sterilization itself would be your orange blocks, but the aseptic processing would be the whole flow chart. Would that be a good way of making a difference between those two? Yes. So your, so your sterilization is more so one part of your aseptic processing. So our sterilization, we have to make sure our plastics are sterile, our solution is sterile, but then we also have to make sure that the area where we're putting them together, that we keep that area clean. We keep clean air, clean water. Um, we, we check on our equipment. So um, sterilization is one block of the aseptic processing. So that was, that was a good explanation as well. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah. So um, as Joy pointed out, we make everything is made sterile and then we put it together, um, keeping in mind that in an aseptic environment, most contamination comes from personnel. So we have to work towards not contaminating the product. So what do you think is the most important item to maintain an aseptic processing. Um, Ms. Brianna is going to launch a poll for us and you guys can answer on the poll and we'll see what we get. You just select the answer. Okay, we got three of three, about five more seconds. Okay. Okay, so we had three out of four answer, and of those three, you guys were 100% correct, so great job. Sterility is the most important item to maintain. If we aren't making um, a safe product um, that people can use and know that it's, I don't have to worry about getting, you know, a weird eye infection or something, then the other three production costs and inventory, they're, they're really not even going to be relevant because your customers aren't going to be buying your product. Um, so number one thing is we make sure we maintain sterility um, when we're in our aseptic area. All right, on to personnel training and monitoring. Um, so just to kind of uh, rehash our pie chart from last week of the top three contributors to contamination, um, studies have shown that 80% of clean room contamination comes from the uh, humans or the, or the uh, personnel that are working in those areas. So how do we mitigate that 80%? If we know that it's happening, what do we do as uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers to try to level off and um, reduce this contamination? 
So one thing that we do is personnel training and monitoring. All personnel that enter our aseptic processing area, they are trained and they're qualified before they are allowed to enter alone. Um, while you're training, you'll have an escort that's there with you um, so that you're so that you're not um, unknowingly contributing to any contamination or causing any cross-contamination. Each person entering the APA must be sampled at least once daily. And I'll show you on the next slide uh, what this sampling process looks like. And then everybody that is, uh, our personnel that are APA qualified, they recertify annually. So we have a recertification program where we can say, okay, Ruth knows how to gown in 2023. In 2024, I have to go through a gowning process to to uh, demonstrate my continued competency in gowning un unescorted. So what does the sampling look like? Here we have our uh, personnel that is leaving the APA. They're fully gowned, head to toe, no skin exposed. And then here we have our microbiolo microbiology technician. And he's using, again, one of those uh, sample plates they are full of agar, which is essentially germ food. If we place, if, if it comes in contact with a microorganism, we incubate it in five to seven days, we're gonna be, we're gonna see a whole lot of multiplication of those bacteria. And then we can visualize and see what was on that person. So we monitor personnel daily. So for instance, let's say that we have line number 10. In line 10, we find a odd mold that we've never seen this mold before. So I have a record of every person that worked on that line and on that day. So we can say, okay, let's go back and let's make sure that my personnel doesn't have mold on them because it's possible I could have brought it in on myself. I could have picked it up from another area and then deposited it, deposited it through cross-contamination on line 10. So it's important that we capture that daily sample so that it, it allows us to see any, any patterns that we refer to as trends in personnel. We can say, okay, well, uh, Mr. Steve, he's he's been getting a lot of uh a lot of recoveries the last 10 days. You know, let's check in with him and see if there's something else going on. Um, because we don't we don't want it to start because of a risk to the product. So why do we think it's important that we sample APA personnel daily? That we get it, you know, we at least get that one sample a day. You can unmute and answer, or you can answer in the chat box. So, Neil or Rodney, if y'all would like to answer this, and that would be great. Um, I will let y'all know I'm going to be signing off in just a few minutes because I have another meeting to attend, and so Brianna's going to be hosting the rest of the meeting and Ruth will continue her excellent instruction. Okay, I'll take a shot at it. I'm gonna... Michelle, Rodney, are you still here? How about Neil? Yes, I'm still, Rodney's still here. Yeah, I'm okay. still here too. What's up? Why is it important to sample the APA personnel daily? Uh, because you want to control. You want to control if you have contamination by a person. If you, if that person got it, and they can have, they can, they can go all day and get worse and worse. And you can lose too much product if you don't catch it early.
Ruth, back to you. Ruth, you still there with us? <laughs> Ruth is saying she's talking, but it's coming up on the screen written. Yeah, Ruth, we lost your video. I mean, your audio. Um, you might want to try turning that microphone on and off again to see if that helps. We're still not getting audio on you, Ruth, so um, you might want to sign off and sign back in again if we can't uh, figure out what the issue is. She's signing off and signing back in, uh, the wonders of modern technology here. Uh, sometimes when we have audio difficulties, I've found that um, that helps with an instructor just to get completely out of the room and sign back in. So meanwhile, I'm killing time talking to everybody. <laughs> and uh, so how are you guys feeling about your assignments? Are things uh, flowing along okay? Are you feeling like it's too much to cover in a week? Uh, I have a question. When, when you're completing one of the assignments, and I don't know if you noticed, I mean, I submitted something on time and it kept saying that it wasn't on time, that it was late. So I kept looking back at it thinking, okay, well, maybe one of these are wrong. I tried to fill in every possible, I think it was the one about name a contaminant listed in the video. And I tried to name every single thing that was listed in that video to see if it would accept it. And it didn't. So I don't know if one is wrong. Does that mean it just doesn't go through completely and it just doesn't go up to that um, question area where it highlights? I, um, Michelle, I thought I, I must have misread that. I thought it was about the crossword and not about the fill in the blank. I'll have to go look at that. Um, uh, it could be uh, the um, sharing. Brianna, you'll need to make um, Ruth a host again. It could be. It could be the um, the grading, posting of the grade. So yeah. let me go look at that. Uh, uh, okay, and then as far as the crossword, I scanned it as a PDF and uploaded it. Is that the way you want us to do it? That's fine. Some people typed it in, some people scanned it. It didn't really matter to me as long as I had answers. Oh, okay, good. Hey, okay. can y'all hear me now? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you so much, Joy. Green one. Okay. Y'all see my screen? No. No. Nah. Okay. How about now? Yes. Okay. Yes. And Ruth, I yes, want you to make me a host. <laughs> I made you the host. Oh, you made me the host? I did by accident. Oh, do do I is it something I need to do different or? Nope, if you'll click on those just three dots by my name and add me as host. Okay, so I open participants and then click the three dots, make host. Okay. Yep. Do you want to change the host? Yes. Did it take my share away? It did, but I'm about to make you co-host. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. You might have to share your screen again. Okay. I'm sharing screen one. And we are still recording. Okay. There we go. All right. We are back in action. Okay. All right. So A, moving on to aseptic gowning and behaviors. So why does this matter? Um, why are we concerned with gowning? Why are we concerned with how we behave? in the APA. So aseptic processing um, requires gowning. That's the coverall suits 
depending on what type of pharmaceutical you're working on, the level of the coverall may change, but they are required to prevent um, contamination from us. That's the people that's working in the APA. And then aseptic processing, we also have to be aware of our behaviors while we're inside the APA, because how we uh, move, how we respond to activities in the APA is different than how we would respond um, outside or even when I simply walk out of that area, but I'm still at work. And we refer to those um, collecti collectively as our aseptic behaviors. So aseptic technique, um, some companies refer to as behaviors. That's an increased knowledge and awareness that individuals working inside the APA have that helps them to decrease and control the micro, um, microbial burden through a series of defined best practices and procedures. And then we have our lovely germ army here that we wanna try to keep, keep under control. So aseptic technique answers some of the following questions. What am I allowed to touch? Am I allowed to touch this item? Should I, should I not pick an item up? Um, how do I manipulate an item? How do I use an item? So I can use a, I may can use my hammer differently if I'm outside working on a machine then when I'm inside the APA, if I want to use a tool in the APA, I'm going to have to make sure that it's clean, make sure that it, um, if it's supposed to come out the sterilizer, that the package I get it from is within the expiration date, that the sterilizer tape has changed in indicators. Um, what order do I perform my sub steps? So um, pharmaceutical manufacturers uh, use a lot of operating procedures, a lot of work instructions that will spell out, I do step one, I do then, once one is complete, I do step two. Once step two is complete, then I do step three. Depending on what those tasks are, if I skip step two and go straight to step three, I may have just contaminated some product or caused a nonconformance. And then where do I hold my hands? We hold our hands up in first air so that we get the clean air from our um, high efficiency particulate air filters or our HEPA filters. Um, where do I place my tools? If I'm not using a tool, I can't just lay it on the floor because now it's contaminated. So where do I place my tools that I want to be able to use again without having to go through a complete um, sterilization process? It also will answer when and how do I clean an object? And then when do we um, reject product? Are all answers that we have to kind of keep in mind when a company develops their aseptic technique um, best practices, as well as when you're, when you're working in a clean room, you can always stop and ask yourself, okay, I dropped this on the floor. The floor is contaminated. Now, what do I do? Do I go get another one? Or if I'm able to clean it, what's my process for cleaning? What's my documentation process look like to show that I've cleaned this item that fell on the floor? So uh, one thing we keep in mind in our aseptic processing area, we always want to protect first air. So these black arrows here, um, this is a demonstration of turbulent airflow. So if our floor is the is considered the least clean or the, the dirtiest part of a room, we don't want any air to come down, touch the floor, and then come back up and be able to deposit contamination through the area. What we use in our clean rooms is a laminar airflow. The airflow flows one direction from a supply at the top to our returns on the side. There is no air that's touched the floor that is coming back up and coming in contact with our worker. So here's our imaginary worker, Mr. Tim. And as he's walking through this area, he's going to disturb this airflow just by his body being there. So as he walks, he's gonna disturb airflow. 
but he wants to he wants to walk in a manner where it's minimized so we try not to walk fast we walk at a steady gait so that we are not disturbing the airflow any more than what's uh necessary or, or any more that's going to occur just by us walking through the air So for our aseptic um, behaviors, we want to avoid unnecessary contact. So we do not touch each other um, in the clean room. Um, if Brianna and I were working in the clean room, how if I'm talking to my to my friend outside of work, I may can put my hand on their shoulder. We're laughing. We're joking. When we're in the APA, I, I should not come in contact with her gown. Um, because now anything that I have on my person is now on her person and anything that she has on her person can now be on me and then we're just cross-contaminating all, all over the place. Um, and then that goes down to the next one, avoid touching the hands of other operators as well. Um, I know you, when we're outside, you know, you may, you may touch your friend's hand jokingly, but we don't want to do that in the APA. Um, you want to avoid touching your own gown. Um, if you, you know, if you sneeze, you have to scratch on yourself or something like that. We really should be going out and regowning, um, so that we're not contaminating product, um, from anything that we have on ourselves. Want to open the doors with your wrist or your elbow. The doors are designed where they have hooks on the outside that you can put your elbow up under. You're not going to find a lot of regular door handles like what you will have at home where you turn a knob um once you go on your APA um they they're they're designed for you to be able to open without touching with your fingertips um as your fingertips are the most sensitive part of your person in the APA because that's what you're going to be using you're touching paperwork you're touching pens computer monitors um, adding components so you want to keep your fingers as clean as possible um, be mindful of cross-contamination um, I always uh, would have to remind myself if I'm going to pick up a phone or I'm going to use a pen let me spray my hands before I touch it because I don't I don't want to leave anything on that pen and then let me spray it after I touch it because I don't know who touched it before me and I don't know um, how good of a job their um, uh, IPA, their uh, alcohol spray was. So that's something you always kind of have to remind yourself. Um, let me spray before I touch it so that I don't add any contamination and then let me spray after so that I don't pick up any contamination. Um, you do not want to touch the floor or pick up items from the floor if you're going to remain in the area. If I'm going out on break and there's something I need to take out that's on the floor, I can pick that up and then I'm going straight out. I couldn't touch the floor and then continue to um, work in the area. And then we spray our hands with isopropyl alcohol, um, commonly referred to as IPA. So IPA kills uh, most bacteria commonly found on our skin. And that helps lower the uh, contamination risk from personnel by spraying our gloved hands with the IPA. Yeah. Anybody have any questions on any of that? Okay. So we are going to move on to cross-contamination. So contamination any material, substance, or energy that is unwanted or adversely affects our product. So cross-contamination is when we unintentionally transfer um, bacteria or other microorganisms from one substance or object to another um, with harmful effect. So spraying our hands and keeping our aseptic um, behaviors in mind can help us eliminate cross-contamination. Yep, so how other ways that we can prevent it, cross-contamination, uh, we clean to physically remove contaminants. So once our 
operation is done let's say we were making um great cough syrup today when it's done we're going to go in and we're going to clean that line and then any contamination that accumulated during that during that batch when we go to make our bubble gum cough syrup we have gotten rid of that contamination um we're going to be doing some disinfecting that reduces the number of microbes we want to make sure that we're using the right cleaning tools um, if our uh, validation process has determined we need to uh, mop our floors with a blue mop that has a certain type of um, mopping surface, we should mop the floor with a blue mop. If we're out of blue mops and the white mops are not validated, they aren't approved to mop the floor, we shouldn't be mopping because that would be an improper cleaning tool if they if they don't have the same cleaning surface. Um, we want to use the right disinfectants, use our proper cleaning and recovery techniques, and then always keep our aseptic behaviors in mind as we move throughout the area. So we're going to move slowly and deliberately. This helps keep the airflow turbulence decreased. Um, so the APA is one area where we do not we do not walk fast. <laughs> Um, if you see somebody walking fast, another person may tell them, hey, you might want to slow down. You, you know, you're you're starting to disturb the airflow a good bit. Um, keep our hands up in first air. We minimize talking. Um, as we talk, um, we can emit spittle um, that can have uh, microorganisms as well. Um, so we try to only, you know, talk only as necessary so that we don't wet our mask to the point to now our uh, face mask is compromised. And then so we're going to watch a short video. I think it's about three minutes. And this is going to demonstrate um, particle counts. Hold on. Hold on, guys. Let me let them know I'm in a class. Hold on one second. Okay, yeah, had a little background. Sorry about that. Let them know. So, what this video is going to show is the particle counts. This is where we're counting our non-viable particles that are in the air. And it's going to demonstrate as we move and do different activities, how those counts change. So we're going to pull this up. And I'm going to add the closed captioning. Okay, here we go. Some acceptable and some totally unacceptable in clean rooms. And we measured the particles that these activities generated. This was done by using a laser particle counter and measuring the dispersed particles. With clean room clothing correctly worn, the particle count was very low. This person who's standing still isn't contributing greatly to the room's contamination. When he moves, he disperses far more particles. The count when looking at a watch demonstrates slowly but purposefully. Even so, we can see that turbulence is caused by his motion through the vertical laminar airstreams. Turbulent vortices, which he creates, are passed quickly through the floor by the airflow and probably cause little damage. Now the incorrect way of moving. The subject is moving far too quickly. Vertical airflow is... Okay. It's diverted by anything in its way, and human arms redirect the airflow from the shoulders, down the arms, and onto the sensitive products being produced or manipulated. The importance of correct body positioning is highlighted by this sequence, which, with control of movement, can make the difference between product yield and rejects. For example, bending the elbows like this. Taking this to the next stage, it's wrong to approach a person working at a clean bench and to talk to them across the workpiece. Obviously, it's wrong whether you move quickly or slowly. 
The correct method is to approach from behind so that neither person faces the workplace whilst talking. We can see that leaning over the work area will cause particles to be deposited on any position of the arms and hands are clearly demonstrated. Of great importance too is the way one behaves at this point. It's completely wrong to rest the hands and elbows on the bench, to scratch one's face, or to touch any other part of the body. Something as simple as opening and closing a hinged box. Here, the speed of action speaks for itself. It's obviously wrong. To do it correctly is not difficult. Needed to behave properly all the time, even when doing something which is totally repetitive. Firstly, a simple transfer of liquid from one tube to another. This applies in the pharmaceutical field, but could equally apply in any clean room. The operative has carefully removed the stopper, sterilized the rim, transferred the solution, then he forgets and rubs himself. <laughs> that was wrong. need to cough, and if you're in the clean room and need to cough or sneeze, you must look away from the workplace. Of course, you shouldn't be at work if you have a cold or influenza or any other illness. Coughing and sneezing can cause an alarming increase in contamination because not only are particles being generated, but they're mixed with liquid droplets in aerosol as well. Masks other than full containment helmets will only by the operative. He's doing it completely wrong. Notice the scrubbing action. We may have exaggerated a little, but there's a big difference between that and here where it's being done correctly. Okay, so that was just kind of give you guys a visual of how um, on how behaving in the clean room, how we can increase those particle counts, and then that's going to um, give more mode of transportation for any viable organisms, um, as well as give a visual of how um, when a person walks through the air, we're we're going to disturb the air just by being present, but we want to minimize um, how much we disturb the air. Um, so anybody want to take a shot at naming one way we can prevent cross-contamination? You can answer in the chat or you can unmute and answer. Anybody? So we're working in the clean room. What is one thing that I could do personally that's going to prevent uh, cross-contamination in the area? Not touching anyone else in the clean room. Yep, so we do, we do not um, touch our fellow workers um, inside the clean room. We don't want to... Uh, contaminate their gown and we don't want to pick up anything that you know any contaminants that are on their gown and take them back with us anybody else have any ideas what is one thing if you're working in the clean room that you should do or not do um that's going to prevent cross-contamination Well, let's see. All right. Well, thank you for answering that for me. So interventions. So in our um, APA area, intervention occurs when we have to intrude or perform an activity or a manipulation in our critical um, ISO 5 areas. So by doing interventions, we have to use aseptic techniques to avoid contamination. So these are going to occur, let's say our machine is jammed, we have a bottle that gets stuck, we have a cap that's stuck, we have to go in and remove that bottle or that, or that cap, and then we have to um, remove it in a manner where I'm not adding contamination to the area and I'm not taking contamination back out with me. So how do we do that? So this is one example of a individual that's performing a 
intervention here. We have a bottle that has fallen down and they're going to spray their hands. They have their gloved hands. They have isopropyl alcohol in this spray bottle. We are going to first clear the line or partially clear the line if necessary. So I could use my forceps and push these bottles here back so that they're out of my way. I'm going to spray my hands. I would use my uh, sterile for my forceps or whatever um, removal tool my company uses to remove this bottle. And then I'm going to spray my um, the area where I was working with IPA and then spray my hands as well. So I spray my hands before I enter the area so that I don't introduce contamination perform my intervention, and then I recover the area um, as well so that I do not take any in my hand so that I do not take any contamination back with me. So when we're handling our um, sterile materials, we want to be sure that we never touch or pick anything off the floor um, unless we are going out, which means I am I'm done working in APA for this session. I'm going out. Uh, we want to minimize and um, hopefully prevent, if possible, having our hoses or tubing from resting on the floor. Um, so we actually use um, shelves in our area, um, in our APA area, where our hoses are going to rest on these shelves so that they're not in contact with the floor. Um, you don't want to hold uh, items against your gown. You don't want to contaminate your gown with that item. And then you don't want to contaminate the item, anything from your gown. And then we want to, if at all possible, always carry items above our waist. Um, so we had one example where we do not uh, come in contact with our coworkers' uh, gowns that Michelle gave us. Anybody um, else want to give us an example uh, maybe Rodney or Neil, an example of proper aseptic technique or behavior, something we should be doing or trying to avoid in the APA. I think Rodney, you were you if you're talking, you were you went back on mute. No, I think I had, was unmuted for a second. So, uh, uh, Rodney or Neil, you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Um, so if you're working in the clean room, what is one thing that you should you should do when you're working in there? Or or one thing that you shouldn't do? We can we can do the reverse. one thing you one thing you should do is always keep your hand hands above your waist. Mm -hmm. and do not touch yourself, you know, with your hands. Yep, yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, both of those, we want to keep our hands up in first air so that our fingertips are receiving the freshly filtered air from our helper filters. And then we do not want to touch ourselves. We don't want to contaminate ourselves um, as well. So thank you. Hey, Ruth, can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. In the video where they were showing the airstream going from top down and mm -hmm. they were trying to illustrate that you walk slowly and how the air is interrupted if you walk quickly, mm -hmm. they, they weren't walking with their hands up, but is it only when you have product in your hands that you should do that? Or doesn't the contaminant get on your hands from your head down if you're yeah. walking? Yeah, so um, for us, we we practice first air. It could be that wherever they, because that, that video, they didn't even have goggles on. So the video is a little dated, but the material is still good. Um, the overall essence of it anyway. Gotcha. Um, so essentially, if your facility is one where they have those HEPA filters, which is going to be most of your um, your pharmaceutical companies that are making medicines, you want to keep your hands up in the first air. It could be just the facility that they recorded that at wasn't classified where they have to follow that rule. Understood. Thanks. Yep. You're welcome. So I need to notate that next time. Because, <laughs> yeah, they didn't even have goggles on either wherever they were. So, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. All 
right aseptic behavior so we're going to go through some video i mean some actual images of personnel and we're going to talk about them whether we think they were doing a good job or whether we could have improved a little bit so there is a video link for you guys to watch this is a, a video that was made at the nasa langley research center it's about 15 minutes so i'm not going to show it in class um but you guys um sometime this week or whatever the due date that said you want to watch that video and i have a couple fill in the blank questions um that's gonna also this is a more um more recent video than the first one we watched um but due to the length and trying to stay um done on time we're not going to show it so just be sure that you guys go and watch the uh nasa video on how to properly use clean rooms i have a question about that too because actually mm -hmm. I, I was on a walk and i figured i'd just watch it uh-huh <laughs> um uh, in that video there were a couple questions they talked about gowning obviously mm -hmm. different iso um standards for uh -huh. that, you know but they when they were talking about wearing the gowns inside the clean room and then walking back out they mentioned if you have to reuse a gown later in the day hang the gown up and i was wondering is that normal because aren't you getting contaminants on the gown while you're in the clean room potentially and then to re-put that on without the glove you know what i mean you're taking the gloves yeah. off so was, for okay, yeah so for us so i saw five areas most manufacturers, when you take that gown off that's it it goes in the bin and then it goes to be laundered um now if you're working in a in a different type of classification that may be an option where you'll have some difference between manufacturers where company a may say okay if i've had my gown on for x amount of time it's still okay for me to use and then company b they may have in their policies hey once you take this gown off it's done okay the um, other question i had was the the, the um foot pads you said you got to walk you got to step on those sticky foot pads kind of mm -hmm. like a roller to get your feet clean while, as you go in mm -hmm. and if it's dirty to pull the top layer off doesn't that contaminate whatever it is on your hands at that point by pulling that dirty layer off does yeah, so so when we do the dirty the the chains for the dirty pool we have um like a schedule cleaning throughout the day and the person that does that does the pool that that person is not going in at that moment so they're they're, they're coming out about to go on break or something like that so they're not they, they wouldn't pull it on their way inside so we have it kind of scheduled where it's changed before it gets to a dirty point where i would have to if i'm going inside where i would have to personally change it gotcha thank you mm -hmm. you're welcome All right, so some examples of first air. So this first image on the left, we have our supply coming in from the top and it goes down and comes to our return vent here. So this individual that's adding the caps here, this is a good example of our, our uh, first air being maintained. Our air that's coming in contact with these uh, caps has not touched anything else here. It comes down and goes to the right. The second image, um, this um, employee is standing before the caps. So as this air comes down, it's going to hit their body. So anything that's on their body is now in this air that then passes over the caps. So this is a, a proper example where we where we do not want to place our body um, in the middle of the airflow because we want this air to be clean that way. Let's say for if we did have a contaminant on these caps, the idea is to say, hey, our um, air is our last, this is our last defense um, to try to get rid of any contamination. So if we observe this, you know, we would probably say, hey, you know, just keep in mind that we're standing um, on this side near the return vent that we're not contaminating the air um, if we were to see this. And all, all the images that I'm going to show you guys, these these are not staged. 
um these were actually um images that we um that I found on during a video review and then this is actually a picture of one of our filling lines as well um where we have the bottles here with the caps that are going out to be um packaged all right some more examples of clean I room. have a quick question could you go back real quick uh-huh Yep. So what he's doing is he's emptying the caps in those in that bin, right? Yep. He's taking the caps from this cart. Okay. And, he's and so adding them to this hopper. Mm -hmm. So the proper way is not to phase or not to be directly where the air is passing towards the caps, right? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. So that way, um, because this this air is essentially um micro microbi you know microorganism free is clean clean air by by you uh if i were to stand here this air touches me first and then it goes to the caps um so yeah good question so that means you always have to be aware of how like the the movements of the air in any particular room that you enter that that is correct you should always be aware of where our return vents are okay. even um like let's say i think this is a chair here yeah we have a chair here even if I'm just sitting in my chair, let's say my line is running good and, you know, I've, I've done my quality checks, I'm going to sit in a chair for a little bit. I, I don't even want to place my chair in front of a return vent because now, now I'm blocking the air from going out and now it begins to, to, to become turbulent. So we have to be aware um, of the return vents. We have uh, our component areas are even marked so that we don't block the return vents. Mm -hmm. yep. I question. actually have a question and you know I'm not a subject matter expert, <laughs> but um, what is the temperature of the air inside? Oh goodness, it's about a, it's a cold 60, 62. Okay. Uh, we have a um, SO, uh, operating procedure that outlines for each uh room each area what the acceptable temperature is and then we have um like an uh, a visual alarm system that if our temperature starts to deviate and it gets you know too hot or the room is about to start sweating you know accumulating uh, moisture uh -huh. it will actually alarm our um security and then they will, hey, I need somebody from utilities to come and to come and look at this. We have a we have a temperature out of range. Okay. And they you. monitor it out like all the time. If somebody said, I wanted to know, I want to know what was the temperature on line C last Tuesday at 5 30, we could pull it up and tell them, oh, it was it was 62 degrees. Oh wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are the gloves latex or latex free gloves? They are latex, but for anybody with latex allergies, they have a pair that they put on before they put those gloves on. And then they will have that was some that would be something that the nurse will have to be made aware of as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You're welcome. Yep. Um, so another example of clean room behavior, we have our gentleman here with his hands up in first air as he should. And then on the right, um, do we think this person is displaying first air on the right hand side? What do you guys think? Anybody want to take a shot at, at this image here? Do we think she has her hands up in first air? I'll say no, because her left arm, her left arm, our right, is out to the side. Yeah, that is absolutely correct. Her hands are not up um, above her waist. Um, that, and that's a habit because uh, most people, as we walk, we walk with our hands down. That's how I walk. Um, so I have to constantly remind myself, okay, put my hands up, up, put my hands up, put my hands up, um, because it's not a natural posture to kind of be in. So we want to maintain first there, even, even if we're walking, we don't want to have our hands down by our side. 
All right, then we have another um, image here. We have this operator with their fingertips in contact um, with the scale. Of course, we're not maintaining first air. Our hands, you know, while we're if we're not using our hands, we should be maintaining first air. And then this is also a cross contamination risk. So if I if this person had anything on their fingertips, it's now on the scale. And if there was anything on the scale, it's now on my fingertips. So the, depending on how thoroughly I spray my hands or if I spray them at all, um, now I can be, you know, contaminating other items. Let's say, you know, I take my hand out the scale and then now I use this pen. Looks like a pen here. So now I've just contaminated the pen. And then let's say that um, Deborah comes later on and now she uses the pen. So now she's got my contamination from the scale on her hand. So I just want to be sure that we we maintain first air. Um, we're going to touch things. That's Nobody's perfect. So if we touch things, we want to be sure that we're spraying with IPA so that we reduce um, cross-contamination. Um, another um, image here, we have an operator who's leaning on the rails. Um, again, if we're not using our hands, we should maintain first air. And then this is also a cross-contamination risk. Anything on this rail is now on her hands and anything on her hands is now on this rail. And she's very close to the rail, so it may even be contact on the front side of her gown uh, with the rail itself. Um, another example, we have an operator here. This is a trash can. This is items from the floor, you know, can go in, in this tray. If I'm going out, hey, I'm gonna throw this in the trash can. Um, so we definitely shouldn't, don't wanna rest our hands on the trash can. Um, so cross-contamination risk as well. So she would need to be sure to thoroughly spray her hands if not completely change her gloves. Um, after touching the, the inside of the trash can. Anybody have any questions? I'm gonna move to our last um, section today dealing with cleaning and disinfecting. All right, so back to our pie chart with our top three contributors, contamination, we had personnel, uh, 80% tools and equipment, 15%, and the environment, 5%. So cleaning and disinfecting, this is what we're going to do to help mitigate this 15%. So how do we keep our equipment clean? How do we keep our tools clean? So APA recovery is a process that we use to return the APA to a state of control so that we can continue processing. So we're gonna have our daily cleanings. These are gonna be our cleanings that we do every single day. We're gonna, let's say we're gonna mop our uh, line floors every day. We're going to mop our corridor where we put on our gowns every day. Then we have our shutdown. So these are gonna be our uh, most a uh, company shut down at least once a year, normally around 4th of July and Christmas. So we're gonna come in and we're gonna do the more thorough and depth cleaning that we're not able to get done in the day-to-day. -day. And then we have our uh, non-routine events um, where something is happening and we have to respond and then our maintenance or we have maintenance activities and we have to clean up after the maintenance activity. So our APA recovery is how we get ready to produce the next lot of production and ensure that we don't we do not have any contamination from the previous lot. Need to update this slide. See a typo. All right. All right. So for our APA recovery we have four different kind of uh, stages or phases. So we have our cleaning, disinfection, sanitizing, and sterilizing. So as we move along these four, the number of microorganisms decreases. 
And as we decrease the number of microorganisms, then we decrease the risk of cross-contamination as well. So we want to use um, our proper um, aseptic technique and our behaviors, and that's going to eliminate and decrease cross-contamination and contamination. So we need um, our aseptic technique and behaviors to maintain the state of control for the APA. So if I'm doing all my aseptic behaviors, I'm, I have my hands in first air, I'm spraying, I'm doing all, all the things that I'm supposed to do. If my area is dirty, it's, it's really gonna be null and void because I'm still gonna be contaminating everything because my APA that I'm working in is dirty. So we wanna have um, good recovery techniques and then we wanna make sure we have um, good aseptic behaviors and personnel techniques as well. Um, so we have two things that contribute to the reduction of cross-contamination, and that's going to be our proper recovery. Are we cleaning like we should in between lots? Are we doing our daily cleaning, our shutdown cleanings, and then our aseptic technique? So those coupled together contribute to the reduction of cross-contamination. All right, so the first one we are going to discuss is cleaning. So cleaning is often confused with disinfection and, sanit and um, sanitizing. In a pharmaceutical manufacturing context, they are not the same. They are not um, interchangeable. So our disinfectants, they kill harmful microorganisms. Our sanitizers reduces our uh, microbiological load. And then cleaners, they return to original state. So cleaning is the most important step to successful disinfection. Kind of think of it, think of it like if I'm going to, let's say I want to disinfect my floor at home, I'm going to sweep before I mop. Because if I don't, if I don't clean my floor and get up all the, the mud, dust, or whatever, or crumbs that's on my floor, how good of a mop is my lifestyle going to do when I didn't, when I didn't clean the floor in the beginning? So cleaning gets you ready to disinfect and do the other um, parts of recovery. So cleaning, that's your physical removal a uh, farm material or visible residues. It can be chemical or mechanical. Um, most most often, it's that's that's going to be a mechanical process. That's going to be as you know, my I mean, sweeping, wiping, getting ready to disinfect, um, and then cleaning helps to address residues from earlier um, sanitizing processes as well. We go ahead and get get those residues out of the way. So we've cleaned, I've, I've, I've swept my kitchen floor, I've, I've gotten my gross material up, now I'm ready to disinfect. So by disinfecting, I'm going to use a chemical that's going to reduce the number of microorganisms. So something in, in this chemical destroys the microorganisms, it's going to disrupt their cell wall, this is it's going to... Um, otherwise make them non-living um, when it's applied to a surface. So there's two common um, disinfectants that um, pharmaceutical manufacturers will use. We'll use cytos that kill bacteria, and then we'll also use sporocytos that kill bacteria and fungal spores as well. So we've disinfected. Next, we're going to move on to sanitizing. So sanitizing, we're going to most often use a sporocytal agent that kills our uh, fungal bacterial spores. And, it's, and the sanitizing agent is going to have a specific contact time. It's going to tell you, you have to allow this to saturate for five minutes or for 10 minutes. And you have to leave the surface wet you would start a clock. I would say, hey, 
I started this at 2 10 p.m. And nobody can walk on this until 2 15 p.m. if it was a five minute contact time. Otherwise, let's say that um I'm walking, I mean I'm I'm mopping and uh Teresa comes and she steps on the floor. I would have to start my time over because it has to be five minute uninterrupted contact time with with my surface and then that's expected to kill all vegetative organisms when you follow the manufacturer's uh recommended contact time so then our last step is sterilization um so sterilization and sanitization they're going to occur in the apa on a on a frequent basis um, depending on what part of the APA I'm in, am I sanitizing or am I trying to sterilize this process? So our lines, we clean, we steam them um, in place because we can't break an entire uh, manufacturing line down. So that way we have a sterile environment where we're, we're filling our bottles. So this covers the uh, steam in place sterilization that we looked that we discussed last week when we talked about um, the four different kinds of um, sterilization. This is this this is our steam in place, and then we're going to sanitize our walls, our floors, um, other equipment. We clean and sanitize that every night because I I can't take a a steamer inside and steam my walls. So we're we're uh left with sanitizing that um some of those services just due to the nature of being able to bring in a steam it's it's not possible so different levels of cleaning so i know some of this may sound a little a little um uh, kind of confusing or convoluted that it's all these different levels of cleaning but we have this we we have the same thing on some of our um, household cleaners. This is um, I took this picture from one of my cleaners at home. It's telling me if I want to clean, I'm just going to wipe it. And then if I want to move to sanitizing and disinfecting, it's telling me, okay, I want to pre-clean my surface. I want to get rid of the gross contaminants. Then I want to thoroughly uh, wet my surface. And then I have to remain in wet for the entire contact time. And then it's telling me if I want to sanitize, I leave it for 10 seconds. And if I want to disinfect, I leave it for four minutes. Um, just note that sanitization in, in an APA is more thorough than disinfection, just from a terminology standpoint. But um, we have the different levels of cleaning. I want to say this was from, a, I think it's from my Lysol or something, um, where it's telling me about, you know, the different levels of cleaning, what um, would be required for me to to reach that state. All right, so for um, the APA purposes, so we have sanitizing, we have disinfecting, we have cleaning, and we have sterilizing. Brianna is going to launch a poll for us. Which one do you got? Where'd the fourth one go? Well, this isn't going to work. <laughs> Well, because the fourth is the right answer, right? Yeah, the fourth is the right. <laughs> okay, so let's just end this poll. <laughs> what what slide numbers is fifty five? Slide fifty five. Yeah. And so let's disregard the poll because the fourth one is the correct answer. Um, sterilization. Um, does kill the most microorganisms of those choices that are in the poll um, sanitizing would give you the cleanest but sterilization is going to kill the most it's just due to um, physical limitations due to equipment limitations we can't always sterilize a surface sometimes we have to sanitize yeah All right, so some common APA recovery activities. So wiping is something that we do commonly. Um, we do these on more of our smaller surface areas. 
you're gonna um you're gonna use a wet and a dry wipe this is gonna be getting some of that residue off um, getting ready to do my disinfecting getting ready to do my sanitizing I have to get rid of all these residues um, and then you want to come behind with the dry wipe um, to make sure that you're lifting those contaminants because sometimes the wet wipe is not enough and then you would want to change your wipes um, as needed so we want to wipe, wipe our surfaces in a single direction using overlapping strokes. Leave our surface um, wet with the disinfectant, and then we apply the same techniques to mopping. So if I were wiping, I'm going to go down, and I'm going to go down, and I'm going to go down. Each stroke that I make, I would flip my wipe to get a clean surface. Um, this helps ensure that you do not miss any areas. And then also help to um, reduce cross-contamination as well by moving in one direction. So when we're wiping, what uh, anybody want to take a shot at? What is the benefit of using overlapping strokes? Why, why would I want stroke uh, two to kind of be in some of the area where um, stroke one has already wiped. Anybody want to take a shot at that one? Just in case when you stroke the first time, you go back over the second time, you might get something that you miss. Yeah, very good. We make sure we get all our areas. We want to try not to miss anything. And so if we did, hopefully the overlap will catch it. Very good. Thank you. All right, mopping. So mopping creates an abrasive action on a surface that's going to loosen particulate and residues. So it removes some of the contaminants, and, but however, while it loosens and removes some, it does not remove all. So we want to be sure that we're allowing our surface um, to be wet um, in um, less than two minutes um, when we're wetting the floor for mopping. So here's an example of a mop system. Um, different companies use different versions. Um, a common use, you're gonna have one bucket here. This is my clean disinfectant here. Then I'm gonna have my ringer bucket where I'm squeezing my mop out. It's gonna go into my blue bucket. And then I have my rinse bucket. So the idea is, I always get fresh, initially fresh um, disinfectant from this bucket. And if we were to sample these buckets, this yellow bucket should be the cleanest one um, because it's been in less and less contact um, with the floor. So a common method um, that is used to mop is called the modified figure eight, where we start with a um, in one corner and we go down and around, moving in one direction from front to back. Um, we would wanna change um, our water once we get two to three gallons in our rinse and disinfected buckets. And then we also wanna change it about every 600 square feet or per, per room. So if I'm mopping line A, and I also have to mop line B, I would want to get clean disinfectant and a clean mop as well. So that way I don't cross contaminate between A and B. So we're going to watch, a, I think these videos about two minutes, we're going to watch a short video on clean room walls. And, um, and then there's one more and then we will be wrapped up for today. I think we'll be about right on time. So let me get this one started for you guys. And these are all in the uh, YouTube channel as well. If you want to go back and review one or look at it at a later time. So this one is on clean room walls. Get out of here. In this video, we will demonstrate three methods for cleaning and disinfecting clean room walls. Always follow your facility's protocol. 
For the vertical method, start at the corner of the room furthest from the entryway, moving the damp mop from the topmost corner down the wall to the floor using overlapping, unidirectional vertical strokes, wetting the mop about every two square meters. Replace the mop head if it touches the floor. Continue this process until the entire wall has been cleaned. Once the cleaning process is complete, follow the same procedure using your facility's disinfectant. For the horizontal method, start at the corner of the room furthest from the entryway, moving the damp mop from the topmost corner across the wall, covering an area you can reach from a standing position. Use overlapping, unidirectional horizontal strokes, wetting the mop head about every two meters. Replace the mop head if it touches the floor. Continue this process until the entire wall has been cleaned. To disinfect, follow the same procedure using your facility's disinfectant. The third method combines both vertical and horizontal patterns so that the contamination from below table height is not transferred up to the ceiling. This is the manufacturer's recommended method. Start at the corner of the room furthest from the entryway, moving the damp mop from the topmost corner down the wall halfway using overlapping, unidirectional vertical strokes across the entire wall, wetting the mop about every two square meters. To disinfect, follow the same procedure using your facility's disinfectant. Next. Why should you use Miro? Yep. When you draw on a whiteboard, I guess we got a With Miro, you plan together in real time from literally every. In this video, we will demonstrate cleaning and disinfecting clean room floors. Always follow your facility's protocol. To clean and disinfect clean room floors, use a single-use mop with a prepared cleaner. Start at the corner of the room furthest from the entryway, moving the damp mop using the place and pull method and overlapping strokes. Cover about one square meter before re-wetting the mop. Continue this process across the entire floor working your way out of the room. Make sure not to step on any areas which have been cleaned. Another method commonly used for cleaning floors is the S-curve method. To perform the S-curve method, starting at the corner furthest from the entryway with a damp mop, make your first pass along the wall edge. Begin the S-curve by walking backwards, moving the mop in an S-shape using overlapping strokes. Make sure to maintain one leading edge throughout the process. At this point, follow the same procedure using your facility's disinfectant. Yep. So what they refer to as the S-curve is the same thing as the modified figure eight. And those videos were from uh, Contact. They make a lot of clean room um, cleaning materials. So they're actually the manufacturer um other material so we have a true false uh poll and this is our last one for today if i'm wiping i should be wiping from bottom to top is that true or false what do you guys think we're going to answer in the poll okay so we have two waiting on one more All right, so you guys did awesome on that one. That question is false. We should not wipe from bottom to the top. So if we, if we were to wipe from the floor to the ceiling and the floor is our most contaminated area, now I've just uh, possibly transferred all kind of different um, contaminants around my area. Um, so that is our last slide for today. Um, do you guys have any questions on any of the content, the videos, the behaviors? Anybody have any questions or comments? Nope. No. Okay. No. All right. You all good? No, okay. I'm all good. All right. Well, just um, check into the class, um, see what you guys 
have do um, watch that NASA video. Um, it's going to go into some more detail. It's going to show you um, ISO 5, and I want to believe ISO 7 or 8. Remember, I, ISO 5 is your, your cleanest area, so it's going to have a little more stricter um, gown and procedure to get into that area. So, Brianna, that's all I have. Um, is there anything else you need from the group? Um, you did mention the job fair that we put oh, in yes. the chat. So in the chat, um, I, we are having a drive-through job fair. I posted the flyer um, in the chat. Um, I will check um, with our um, representative to find out um, if, you know, if it will kind of, if you guys should come or just wait till we do the on-site. But if you guys know anybody um, that's looking, you know, feel feel free to share it with them as well. Um, it lists the opening as well as um, the minimum salaries as well. And it's the flyer is in the chat. Um, can they still see it? Because I don't see it in mine. Can you see it, Brianna? I can see it in mine. Michelle, can you take a look at the chat and tell me if you can see the job fair? Um, no, am I looking at the meeting chat or am I looking back? Mm -hmm. I do not see anything there. I think it might have, when I got booted, when I had to leave, I think it might have. It might have. Okay, let me put it back in there so you guys have it. Do we um, go to the Greenville Tech next on Friday? It says 8.30 to 4, or I think. Um, are we at the school? Huh. Friday? I see that, but... April 14th, you are at CMI again, 8.30 to 4. That is your lab day. Okay, so there's nothing different that we do that day. We just showed up to the same room? Same room, yep. Same room as the first meeting. Gotcha. And that'll also be your last day at Greenville Tech because May 12th will be at Bosch and Lom's facility. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Um, I do see it now, Ruth. Okay. Yep. So let's see what day was that on. So we can just download that. There we go. Yep. So it's on April the 29th. So um, if you guys know anybody um that's looking as well, feel feel free to share that with them. Um, as well, if you do come or if you have somebody come tell them, please make sure to have their resume with them as well. When Great. they come. All right. Yeah, so you you. All right. You're welcome. You guys have a good day. And I guess, yeah, we, I, guess. I will see you guys uh, next Wednesday. Perfect. All right. Thank, thank you. All. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.